that, uh, so first of all, I'm Duncan Wong uh, from Astri, and today we are very pleased to have the president of the Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong, uh, Leo, over here to share with us about his insights on Bitcoin as well as blockchain. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you know about uh, Leo. Leo is a very active, um, I, I, I have to say, is a practitioner in Hong Kong on blockchain and Bitcoin. And he has contributed a lot um, to the popularity as well as introdu introducing uh, Bitcoin and blockchain to Hong Kong, uh, to the industry as well as to the community. So today we are very happy uh, to have Leo here and uh, come all the way to, to the science park uh, to share with us. Because usually according to uh, Leo, they, they have this kind of regular sharing section in Causeway Bay, uh, in TST, sometimes uh, in Kuntang as well. And this is the first time for the uh, Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong to come over to new territory. So I hope that in the future we can have more sharing coming from the Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong with us. Uh, so that our main objective as Astri is to promote this disrupting, game-changing technology. And we hope that we can have more and more startups and also big companies that can adopt this uh, blockchain technology in the very near future so that we as uh, Hong Kongers are not lagging behind when compared with the uh, global development of blockchain. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will have uh, Liu to give the presentation. But before that, we will also like to present a souvenir so that you can remember us and uh, uh, and come over more and more uh, often to get the souvenir from us. Okay, thank you very much. All right, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. I'm very happy to be here. And, and share with you how uh, a blockchain works and what a blockchain is. Um, because this is really a, a going to be a transformative thing in the world of finance, but also in the world um, beyond finance. And uh, we're just at the very beginning, and we don't know exactly how this is going to play out, um, but we know that um, it's probably going to have as much of an impact uh, on us as the internet did. And today it can be if you're just without Wi-Fi for a day or two, um, it's, uh, you get a reminder of how drastically our lives have changed. I will explain um, at first how the Bitcoin blockchain works, um, because this is a blockchain that has um, existed now for over seven years. Um, this has not have any like hacks or has not have any um, downtime at its core. Um, applications built on top of it have had seen um, a few problems though. Um, but as far as the blockchain is concerned, um, we know quite well how it works and what it can do and we have a lot of experience and um, what attack structures look like and what its weaknesses are and what its strengths are. Um, and then later on I'm going to um, go a little bit in like what, that, that's where all the buzz is right now coming from. Especially in Hong Kong um, within the speech of uh, our financial secretary um, in various conferences, um, in um, announcements and partnerships, for example, from the Monetary Authority, the, the buzz that we see in Hong Kong is coming mostly from um, the underlying uh, technology. And um, if we have time, a little bit of how, how blockchain and Bitcoin look like right now in Hong Kong. A blockchain needs to do three things um, to work. Um, at first, it needs authentication, so each member of, or each participant in that blockchain needs a way to show um, that these are really your accounts, or these are really your funds. A way to prove that you are really you um, in a way that is easily verifiable uh, for uh, the system as a whole, not just a single computer. Um, the second thing is the messaging layer. So a blockchain needs a way for, to be able to read and understand what do you want to do. Do you want to send funds to somebody? How many of these funds? Where do you, where do you want to send them to? Um, and third of all, it needs a way of ordering them. And that um, might seem um, very, um, a very small part, but that is actually the fundamental innovation of what a blockchain does. Because a lot of the stuff in number one and two, uh, we've been able to do using various methods of cryptography um, for about a decade or two now. And we had various 
systems in place, um, some in big banking institutions, some in, in simple messaging apps that do um, one or two. But what we haven't been able to do until the Bitcoin blockchain came along, until Satoshi um, Nakamoto, um, the pseudonymous individual or group who um, proposed this method, we haven't been able to really verify which of two transactions came first. And that's known as the double spend problem. If you have, it's, it's relatively easy um, using cryptography, I'm gonna quickly explain this to verify that you are really you, and it's easy to verify that it's you who wants to spend a certain amount of funds. But if I want to say, if I have um, one Hong Kong dollar, and I want to spend that Hong Kong dollar both to um, the, the shop next door, and give that Hong Kong dollar to, um, to myself again, then we haven't been able to really verify which came first and to create a historical um, order of these things. And that's what uh, the blockchain does through something called mining or proof of work. The Bitcoin and um, presumably all blockchains use a kind of public private key encryption to verify um, who you are. This is also quite uh, common in, um, in, in, in email encryption programs or in, um, for, similarly, in, when you get these HSBC devices, they also have a little public key in there, a private key in there, and HSBC keeps a copy of your public key. You create this key pair using a simple algorithm on your computer. Um, you don't need to register that key anywhere, but you just create it, and essentially it's just a large number. You can imagine this as a, uh, a lock and a key. You create this pair on your own computer, and you can give out the lock safely to anybody. Um, and all they will be able to do with the lock is, for example, um, put things in a box and lock that box with the lock that you gave them. And only you, because you have the key, can go around and open these locks with messages that are meant for you. Um, even And you never give that uh, key um, you never give it to somebody else. And that's how everybody can safely give you messages that only you are able to read. And it can only be used the other way around. Like you can use a lock that is locked and then publicly open it to prove to everybody in the room that you are really the owner of this lock, that this lock really belongs to you, simply based on the merit that you have the key to that lock and therefore it must be yours. In Bitcoin, these keys are just large numbers. Um, and I won't explain too much, these are just two different ways to display um, these numbers, but you create a random large number. Um, and that's a little bit um, strange for us, that you own something purely because you have um, generated this large number. Because to us it seems that this large number, why wouldn't two people be able to generate that exact same number? Um, and Bitcoin is really only secured on the property that these numbers are so large that the chance of two people generating the same one are infinitely small. So small that we can safely say you will never generate two numbers again. Um, so small that if you had a dart, um, a dart, um, uh, a dart board and you shrunk it to the size of a, of a DNA strain, and you put it in some random place in the universe, that then to guess the same number twice, you would have to hit that dart uh, twice with a dart here. Any, that, that's anywhere in the universe. The second thing that uh, Bitcoin does is the messaging layer. And the messaging layer, I think, can be understood um, through checks. Um, a, writing a check is very similar in writing a Bitcoin message. You have the logo of the bank on the top left. In this case, the message also has an indicator that it is a Bitcoin message or in, in other blockchains that it is for another blockchain. It has a date on top. The check has an ID number, um, so it's like a serial number. Um, it references the account that your money is coming from. And in this case, um, it references more of a, of a previous transaction, it references a previous check. Um, and it references an account um, of where the money is going to. 
And here in the two field, we see this number beginning in one, numbers beginning in one and three that look a little bit like this. Those are Bitcoin addresses. Um, so you would create this key pair on your computer. From the public key, you can derive this address. And then all you need to give me is this address, which is this public lock. So you give me anything um, that I send to this address will only be spendable by you, because only you have the private key to kind of unlock this. Um, I can uh, I attach an amount to it. Um, I sign it. And Bitcoin also has this neat little feature that you can write little messages at the bottom of this check. Um, and in the standard message, it seems quite boring. You, you can receive those, um, uh, you can spend those funds immediately. But a lot of interesting, um, more complicated applications build on those things to be, um, to be more complex um, me uh, messages. Uh, for example, you can think of a message like, to spend this money, the recipient has to prove they own two of the following three keys. Uh, which allows you to create accounts that are hold not by a single individual, but are hold by three individuals. Um, so you already have a more complex um, um, trusts or more complex multi-signature accounts. This signature is a cryptographic signature. It's not really your name. It's more of a, of a, of a, of a big number. Um, but the computer is able to um, look at this transaction and verify the following things. First, they can check if the signature really um, is valid. Is it really a valid signature of, of, of this message? Um, the computer is also able to verify is this signature made by the owner of the previous funds? And they can verify whether you really have those funds by looking at the um, previous transactions. And through that, you already have a, if we only have the first two things, we could already easily imagine um, building a, a centralized network from that, where I am the guard of that network, and all of you could simply um, par participate by creating those key pairs and sending those messages for me. And since I am, since I am, the, since I am the guard and I'm the authority, and I can order these transactions simply by in what order they arrive with me, I can easily then say, I, this money has not been spent, and this money uh, hasn't been spent. And in a way, minus the public-private key pairs, this is how PayPal works. So PayPal simply um, has, PayPal doesn't have a private and public key pair, but pay, PayPal has a pair of an email address and a password. Uh, which is a very similar concept, something public that you can give out to anybody safely, and something private that you never tell anybody, uh, being the password. And then PayPal has this, um, these, this list of amounts, and when it receives a message, and that message in this case is more you clicking button in your, in your, in your app or on the uh, website, but it's still, it's still a message. It's still a message saying, I want to send money to somebody. And now PayPal can simply change these numbers around. Bill wants to send money to Barbara, and they can simply take um, $10 from Bill and add that to Barbara. In a blockchain, um, it looks a little bit more like this. So there are no names. Um, there are simple um, addresses. And each of these addresses also has an amount, has a, um, has a value to it. To Now for each participant to look up whether you really have enough money is relatively easy because they have this list. But how do they update this list? Um, because there might be thousands and thousands of participants, and one participant might say that here's an ATB address is, has spent all their money, and another one might disagree, or might disagree saying they have spent it somewhere else. So you can imagine the Bitcoin um, protocol as a network of computers that anybody can connect to, um, and anybody can download this history of transactions. Um, Every time somebody makes a message, you're passing that message into the network, and then it floats around the network. I'm going to show that in a second. And each of these computers that take part in it keep a copy. So this could be the Bitcoin network. Each of these Bs is a computer. Um, anybody can simply join it and connect to the other 
um, to the other computers, and they all talk to each other. They all keep a record of all the transactions that ever happened, and they all listen to new transactions that are coming in. So there might be a transaction um, coming in um, that this node at the very top hears about first, and it simply passes it on. Passes it on to its neighbors, which pass it on to its neighbors, and then very quickly the um, entire network has heard of it. And in this case, they're all in agreement of what happens. They have all added a, a new transaction to the history, and they all don't have any conflicts, so they can theoretically now all um, update um, this database, and everybody will still be in, this, in agreement. But the same message might pass through the system um, with two competing messages. So two messages that contradict each other. Um, the same coin being spent twice to two different individuals. They will, again, both spread to their neighbors, but very quickly, the network is split. So now certain nodes are saying, I heard first that you're trying to spend the money at the coffee shop, and the other half of the network will think first, no, no, I, I saw you buying an online game with this. And now they're in disagreement of where the money is. Now they have um, two different databases. They have two um, different outcomes. And to resolve this, there are a variety of options. And um, we're first going to look at the most simple one, and then going to look at um, what option uh, Bitcoin or Satoshi Nakamoto has chosen. Um, so we could just simply pick any node, right? We could just say, every 10 minutes, a random computer here is chosen, and this random computer then is simply the, the, is simply the authority of what happened in those 10 minutes. So then within 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, the network will easily resolve. Um, for example, this node might be chosen, and then the others would simply say, okay, you were, this one is the authority. Um, we, since we respect the authority, um, I'm going to throw away my conflicting message and accept the one that this node has heard of first. So in, already in this case, um, a network split would only occur for a maximum of 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, everybody would be in agreement again. Now, the problem with this is that what stops, what stops me from simply connecting 100 new computers to this network, or 1,000 new computers to this network? They might even be fake computers, like virtual machines. And the more computers I have joined in this network, the more likely I'm going to be chosen, and the more likely I'm going to be chosen, the more control I have over the network. And this is what's called a civil attack, but this means that in a, in a blockchain where you choose a random participant, you have to restrict somehow entry of new participants. So you have to create, you have to have a, a guard at the door who says who can and who cannot join, which creates a lot of other interesting uh, political problems. The second one is um, used actually quite a bit in other blockchains it chooses the richest node. And richest node in this mean case means who has the most tokens themselves, and the more, not that always the richest one is chosen, but proportional to how many um, tokens you have, you are more likely to be chosen as the winner. Um, and the assumption is that somebody who has more tokens um, is, has a stake in the system, it's called proof of stake, and you cannot in this case, simply bring in a thousand new members because these thousand members are not going to have any tokens. And if you have a thousand tokens and spread your thousand tokens over a thousand fake members, you might have um, done a little bit for your own anonymity, but you haven't really increased your chance of, um, of, of being picked overall because you're still overall only have a uh, thousand tokens. And so in this case, for somebody to take control of the system, they would need to first buy into the system. They would need to first acquire tokens, uh, which already makes it a lot less likely that this person wants to destroy the system um, because you, um, well, you just bought into it. The solution that Bitcoin is using is something called proof of work. Um, it's, a, it's a quick algorithm um, that can be summarized as a guessing algorithm. You guess a number, 
you hash it. This hashing um, takes a bit of time, a very short amount of time, but um, significant amount of time and, and, and energy that you cannot do an infinite number of these hashes every second. And this, the solution that you come to has to uh, follow certain rules. For example, it's, it's really just a, a, a blur of, of numbers that looks like um, gibberish. But you just say a random, it has to have zeros in the beginning. You could also say it has to spell a word in the Oxford Dictionary, or you just create an arbitrary restriction. And already, if you want to take control of this system, you have to, um, if you want to take control of this system, you have to spend more energy on it. And not only that, but there is nowadays um, specific hardware that you need to buy. Um, so there's significant costs involved to that. And this cost is then now essentially the attacking cost on Bitcoin. So how much does it cost to take over the system? Um, we can easily calculate that. How much would it cost to acquire enough computing power and enough energy to get a significant portion of your of this um, overall power of the network um, to, for example, acquire more than 50% to be chosen more than 50% of the time. And then, so now one node um, found the solution and is allowed to pick the winning transaction. So again, within an average 10 minutes, the system comes to a consensus. And the system comes to a consensus um, by just being able to verify that this solution that they have found is the solution that the network has agreed on to be the um, to be the authority. Now, why would you burn all this electricity and why would you buy all this computing power just to um, just to take part in the system? And for that, the system rewards you. Um, so the system, when you are winning this, when you are guessing the right number, you also have the right to include a new transaction into into the transaction that you otherwise include in a block. Um, and this right allows you to send yourself out of nowhere, um, right now, 12 and a half Bitcoins. Um, two months ago, it was still 25 Bitcoins. Um, it, you are allowed to create money out of nowhere. And this is how Bitcoins are being created. This is how Bitcoins are being distributed. Um, so Bitcoins are distributed to whoever contributes to the security of the system, and they're, con they're created in a predetermined schedule. Every 10 minutes, um, I'll cross this out. every 10 minutes in the very beginning it was 50 bitcoins, um, for the next four years it was 25 bitcoins, right now it's 12 bitcoins, um, in four years it's going to be uh, 6.75, 6.625, um, until it reaches zero, right? And that's how you overall come up with this number of 21 million Bitcoins that were going to be created. And overall, so there's a, a second um, thing they're able to take as a, as a winner of this block, um, the transaction fees. Um, because in the long run, of course, there wouldn't be any incentive anymore to mine Bitcoins because uh, you get less and less and less. And in the long run, you will have to just collect the uh, transaction fees. This is also economically very interesting um, because usually in most economic systems, money is created in a very different way and the overall supply of money is adjustable. So it's very easy to withdraw money from circulation or inject more money into circulation. And here it's all perfectly predictable and relatively um, like a static curve. Um, but it also creates an interesting incentive for the for the system to um, <coughs> supply liquidity in this market. Because the miners, since they bought into the computing power and wasted all this electricity, they now have to sell these Bitcoins to pay for these costs. Um, so they're, and that's why Bitcoin very early on had a very vibrant exchange market, because there were individuals, participants, who had to sell their Bitcoins for uh, whatever they could get for them. Now, all of this is not Ma a magic uh, solution for everything. All of this is quite limited in um, what it can do and what it even currently can do. Um, so for example, right now we can only handle 
uh, depending on what kind of transactions they are, between three and seven Bitcoin transactions. So seven transactions here per minute uh, per second is really the, the upper limit already. And that's quite little for everybody who, um, who is familiar with how many transactions um, Alibaba is making um, or PayPal is making. They're making thousands of transactions per second. Um, and Bitcoin has this limit. It's more of an artificial limit. Um, if, since it's an artificial limit, it can be simply artificially changed um, or raised or reduced, um, but that has also has complicated implications. Um, fungibility is an important characteristic of a monetary system. One Hong Kong dollar is worth exactly a tenth of a 10 Hong Kong dollar note. Um, and there is no, at, at one 10 Hong Kong dollar note is worth exactly the same as another 10 Hong Kong dollar note. And that usually happens because it's you're forced by the government to accept money as money, um, and you cannot easily say, I will um, accept more for this uh, coin and accept less for, for this other coin. Um, but in Bitcoin, there's nobody guaranteeing this, but also in Bitcoin, you have the ability to trace all transactions throughout history, and you might say, this might have been going through a sketchy place, I will not accept this. And suddenly, a Bitcoin is no longer worth the exact same as another one Bitcoin. And that makes um, money a lot less useful. Um, it's all software. Um, software might not understand what, how we expect it to behave. Uh, software might have little bugs in it that we don't even, uh, that we aren't even able to foresee. Um, information security. So now, how do you keep this private key? How do you really keep it secure? And I'm not entirely convinced that all of the computers that we own are really would be safe places for such a key. Because they might be compromised, or they might be easily compromisable. Maybe the only reason why they haven't been compromised yet is because they're not valuable targets enough. But as soon as you put money in them, suddenly they become very valuable targets. Um, for example, we saw this with, and this goes a little bit with uh, attractive for criminals, a very common, um, a very common malware or virus that has been spreading around all over the world is something called a crypto locker. It's something that infects your system, encrypts all the data, and then asks for money in return for this to be, um, for this to be, um, for the, your data to be released. And if you don't have enough backups of your data, then you either have to pay or you lose your data. It's been a quite a few high value institutions also been hit by this. In and that is a kind of malware that has been only really attractive um, since Bitcoin got along because paying people through um, Alipay or through um, iTunes gift cards, it exists. But it's not as easy as receiving Bitcoin from people. And these computers have been vulnerable to this kind of malware for a very long time, but they simply never got attacked because it was not um, worth enough. Now, what else can we? Can we do with this? Right? So we know it has quite a few limitations already, um, so it's not something that we want to apply to everything. Um, one interesting characteristic for when we're talking about open, distributed, peer-to-peer -peer blockchains is that we cannot think of a way for them to work um, without currency. We can think of them to work beyond currency, so we can think of them to do many, many other things, like we're going to talk later about it, um, stock and identity. But we can't really think about how they would work without a token, without a currency. Because even in the two, in the two most um, common and pretty much the only um, existing types of consensus algorithms are proof of stake, where you have to prove how many tokens do you really have, or proof of work, where you have to waste an, an electricity and then get rewarded with tokens, both of those fall apart if you take the token away. And if you take the token away, most of the time it's really just a, a normal database. Um, there might be a database that makes other uses of technology that's used in Bitcoin, like cryptography um, or um, a federated network, but there usually still is some authority that needs to decide who can come in to the network, for example, or who is allowed to make transactions. Um, and this authority then again um, removes really the peer-to-peer the -peer part, removes the decentralized part. Um, right now, and that's been true for the last seven years, um, 
blockchains have been proven to have gigantic network effects. Uh, so the Bitcoin blockchain has about 80% of the total value of all blockchains in the world. The second largest blockchain, um, Ethereum, has about 80% of the remaining 20%. Um, and that already leaves only 4% of the total value for the third to 10,000th most popular blockchain. There really are um, a few thousand, but in terms of value, the, it's a gigantic um, uh, power distribution. If you want to, um, if you want to consider other uses, right? So there are a few things you could build on directly on top of, of Bitcoin. Um, for example, Nasdaq private market um, has gotten a little bit quiet about how they actually work, but the last indicators were that they use an existing database. They have been using um, databases for a long while, but they use a um, Bitcoin is version control. So imagine they use an Excel spreadsheet and then they send that Excel sheet spreadsheet around by email. They might have people might be in disagreement over which really is the latest version, and there's not really a place to, to look that up, um, and there can't be a place to look it up, because that would be vulnerability again. So simply creating this Bitcoin blockchain as a place to look up which, um, um, which is the latest version. And that makes use of, remember the check earlier, it had a field at the bottom, you can just write anything you want in that field, and you can, for example, write the today's version of our database has the following key. Um, colored coins are also interesting. So instead of me sending um, a Bitcoin to somebody, I simply send like a tiny, tiny amount, like a millionth of Bitcoin, but I add a little message. And that message might say, this coin represents um, a, a car with the serial number X. And now, as long as people consider this, um, this message of authority, um, or as long as there's some system that has this as an established tool of ownership, um, you could then imagine this message to really be a transfer of ownership. Because even if the other person only gets a millionth of Bitcoin, which is uh, more or less worthless, the, the world still sees that the ownership of the car has now changed. Um, so if things like this can be in, um, an easy way to to simply switch any kind of ownership type. Um, Ethereum is also very, uh, so it's the second largest blockchain, also very uh, fascinating, you might have uh, come across it already. Um, it does not necessarily keep track of um, money, even though it still needs a token to function, but it keeps track of computer programs, and you, you run those, instead of verifying transactions in the way we did earlier, you verify computer programs. How many, oh, what time is it? How much time do I have left? Just need to understand how to read the device. Okay, great. Um, because this is something that's, um, this has been creating most of us. Right? And so when the monetary authority or when um, the financial secretary or when um, the big American banks or the British government talk about blockchain, a lot of the time they mean something like this. They don't mean a scary system that burns a lot of electricity that anybody can join and where people can just do, like, get paid for malware attacks. Um, they mean something that still maintains some control um, over who is part of it, who can uh, transact, um, uh, some leave some ability to freeze funds, um, can be a lot more energy efficient. If you have an authority that, uh, that makes sure nobody can enter the room randomly, then you suddenly no longer really need to waste energy. Um, but you again have somebody in control of registration, somebody who can um, freeze funds. Um, you still end up with a few interesting um, questions, like it would probably still be a public database. Um, in a public database where people could see who has how much funds and 
who transact with who um, might not be the preferred outcome for many participants. Um, and there's a question of when is this thing really just a data thing, right? If, if we were, all this buzz that blockchains create kind of indicate that we're not just talking about a database because databases don't generate buzz and nobody, uh, nobody includes kind of, or even includes the database decisions into a, into a budget speech or spends billions on databases. Well, they do spend billions on databases, but they do it quietly. Um, there's, there's something unresolved there, something that makes us want to talk about this potential ability for anybody to hold funds themselves and interact in a peer-to-peer -peer way with the entire world without um, needing to ask for permission and something that makes us uncomfortable about that idea too. Um, I'll go quickly through this and then we have some uh, time for questions. Um, currency, done, right? Um, exists. Keeping identity in the blockchain is something that we're very close to. It's something that already exists, it's not very popular. Um, in this case, an identity means a, um, like a username or a URL. An identity is your website.com, or an identity is your Twitter handle or your Facebook handle. And that's something that we're already able to, to put on a blockchain um, because it's actually very little data, um, so it doesn't generate too much waste to put that onto a public um, database that's uh, distributed around the entire world. And it's something that's not really backed. If you create a username on the blockchain, that username itself is the value, right? For other things, like for stock or for art or music or land, there usually is either a legal system behind that backs your right. So if I just create a right, let's say I compose a, um, a musical and I, I write the um, ownership rights of the, the copyright rights into the blockchain, it's something I could do today and I could transfer that now, but for the buyer of this token to be recognized as the owner, it takes more than just whether it's on the blockchain or not, right? This is still dependent on whether the legal system behind us still recognizes whether we have now made an effective um, transfer of ownership. Um, so similarly for land. Land transfers is something that would be very easy to do on a blockchain, but whether it happens or not depends on the legal system behind it. And usually legal systems don't, don't chase um, trends like that very quickly. So I'm not quite sure how quickly we're actually going to see a legal system backing um, replacing their these old books they might in, in some countries they're like really old books written on leather um, to last the next centuries and they haven't even made they haven't even made the, the step into printing yet right we still write it by hand um, so not quite sure it's going to be done um, with the blockchain very soon um, similarly to contracts a little bit easier because that's done between two consenting individuals um, and especially the, um, the English law system um, is quite generous in interpreting what a um, consensual agreement between two parties is. So you might make it that agreement in, through an email, um, you might do it on, a, um, on an old paper, or you might just do it on a blockchain. Um, I will upload all these later, but this is like the long form of what I've tried now to, to, run, to run through. Um, this is ordered by how likely I think um, we're going to see it. Um, URLs, um, DNS records, ownership of, of Twitter handles, that's something we can, we can do today, that we, are, we can are doing today. Um, art um, depends really a lot more on a, on a bigger network effect and the interests of the artists and the people buying art. In a way, 